Halloween, a time where we celebrate all that is horrific and scary, where kids dress up as disgusting monsters and go out late at night to vie for the affection of complete strangers in the hopes of being showered with delicious candy, where for some reason the delicious pumpkin is the embodiment of everything evil in the world. That, and we get awesome special editions of YouTube content. Splatterhouse 2! One of the goriest games on the Sega Mega Drive. It was even among the first titles to have a rating attached to it by the Video Game Rating Council, Sega's short-lived attempt at rating video games before the ESRB took over. Anyone who was anyone and owned a Mega Drive had this game. But before it appeared on the Mega Drive, its predecessor was released as one of the most infuriating goddamn token-taking games that arcades have ever seen. No, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. No. No, no, yeah. Sweet. I'm glad. Let's do that. Let's... Let's do that. Come on! Come on! Crummy hit detection, agonizingly slow movement speed, and only four lives to dodge all of these fuckers who are constantly out of your reach. And that death sound? It's like an old man wearing a pillow over his head trying to get out of bed. The game is brutal. But after about 30 minutes of playing it and wishing I were dead, I managed to make it to level 4 and get footage of some of the fucking warped enemy designs. Like this. And this. And whatever this is. And the most fearful, vile, disgusting monster that anyone has ever faced. Chair! Are you scared yet? When the game was ported over to the TurboGrafx-16, it also came with a rating on the front of the box that said, The horrifying theme of this game may be inappropriate for young children. And cowards. Hey. Hey, what's with that? You don't know me. The second game in the Splatterhouse series was released on the NES, under the name Splatterhouse Wanpuku Graffiti, roughly translated to Splatterhouse Naughty Graffiti. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It was a huge graphical departure from the arcade version, deciding on a cutesy, exaggerated art style. Yay, my boyfriend suddenly came back from the dead for some reason. Uh-oh, a giant flying pumpkin. It was basically the same game in terms of mechanics. Hit, walk, hit, walk, hit, walk. But Rick and- Yeah, give me that candy. But Rick and Jennifer were rendered in a cute chibi design. Oh hey, it's Dracula. Yes. Peace to you too, Dracula, Lord of the Night, Prince of Darkness, Commander of the Undead. Peace to you too. That's not to say the game was without its- what the fuck are those? Uh, without its fair share of weird things. There's a boss reminiscent of The Exorcist, where a girl is on a bed and her head twists unnaturally until it actually just pops off and starts fucking flying around. Hey, you uh, you alright there? You need to throw up or something? Too many candies? Maybe you should- Oh, Jesus Christ. That poor girl. If only she had- Oh, nope, nope, she's fine. Check out that underboob. The game seems constantly at odds with itself, trying to be cute while referencing all these different horror movies like Evil Dead and Alien at the same time. But for some reason, it works. Splatterhouse 2 was the first console iteration that kept the themes of the classic arcade game complete with all of the same gore and entrails of the arcade version, and nowhere near as difficult. The story is basically the same as the first two. Jennifer is in the hands of some evil spirits, and you have to go and save her with the help of Jason's ma... the, the terror mask. Yeah, drip down that wall, you gooey fuck. That splattering on the walls was like the greatest thing I had ever seen when I was five years old. That and the fact that the enemies could hurt each other, or die of their own accord, Bye, demon. Just like the arcade game, the bosses were gross, fleshy, pulsating demons of all kinds. 
Here we have skinless penis, Rod Stewart, giant fetus quadruplets hung from the rafters by nooses around their necks, and walking phallus that turns into spider. That's just fucking beautiful. Splatterhouse 3 changed up the classic side-scrolling formula by having Rick become a scholar, collecting and saving precious literature from the demon clutches. No, not really at all. But you do collect books for some reason, and I still haven't figured out why. It did change the gameplay up a bit though, by introducing exploration and branching plots. You're given a timer on each level, and if you take too long, something will happen that changes the story. For instance, if you don't rescue Jennifer in time, she's consumed by a demon worm. You also get new moves, like the ability to destroy and reform your shirt at will, and the ancient art of the dick punch. Rick, just... just settle down now. Also, the game is filled with these bullshit segments where you can't dodge the enemies, and you just have to walk through them as fast as possible. But they just keep spawning! That ain't fun! Come on! Can someone just lend me a hand here? Did... did I actually just... did I... did I just make that joke? No, that's okay. I'll let myself out. No, that's fine. The gore in this one isn't as severe as what the fuck was that? What the fuck was that? A flying face just stole my weapon with its chin. Okay, cool. Sure. Why wouldn't that happen? It's not as gory as the previous games, and the difficulty is all but gone, but it's still got some weird fucking bosses in it. I'll just leave you with this walking dickworm that laughs like a child. Oh, so there was a 3D remake that was really shitty, but they got the voice of Catdog to play the terror mask, so that's pretty cool, I guess. Right now, what do I want? Not the same as any god. Little faith. For without faith, I am nothing. And without me, you're fucked. Did you like this? Why not subscribe and check out some of my other stuff? Be sure to like the page on Facebook and follow the Twitter and don't forget to sign my guest book on GeoCities. Thank mm -hmm. you.